Hi, everybody. Some familiar faces, a few new faces. Good to see everybody, especially if you're in the UK. I don't know what it's like in other parts of the world. Very, very hot here, uh, which is nice for a short period. Uh, hope you're having the opportunity to take advantage of it in short bursts. Um, we'll make a, a fairly prompt start, uh, so we'll give it another minute. We are recording, so if you say anything or come on to the screen with your video, you will be recorded, um, and uh, you may just want to be aware of that. So we've got three great speakers here today. And I uh, hope you've got some questions around the topic of measuring in the circular economy, measuring success. I'm going to give a, a sh very short introduction to it in a second, and then we'll kick off. So please do fire your questions in on the chat box or when we've been through each um, presentation, um, then we can uh, have, a, have a discussion for the majority of the meeting. What I'll do is if, if there are a couple of questions that come in uh, af after a presentation, I might, I might just take those um, and, and field those to the, the speaker. If they're more general questions, I think I'll leave those until we've heard all three speakers and ask each speaker in, in, in turn to respond if they, if they so wish. Okay, I, th I think we'll get started then. So welcome everybody on to, I think this is the final webinar of our uh, summer series. Um, and uh, one of the things we'd be really appreciative of today is, is if you have other suggestions for webinars for our autumn and winter series on, on around the theme of measurement, uh, then please, please do let us know because it's a massive topic. And there's only so much you can do in one short online event and some of you may have been in a, an event last September which kicked off our webinar series on, on measurement of the circular economy at national aggregate scale uh, which is quite a long session. Today we're sort of looking a bit more focused around, around product related product scale circularity and the measurement of success at, at uh, product scale. The reason for that is we get an, an enormous number of requests uh, or have a number of conversations about this topic from many, many different types of stakeholders. So we thought we would uh, give an opportunity for our three speakers to give diverse but connected contributions around the work they're doing in different, different areas. So um, my name is Peter Hopkinson. I'm co-director of the Circular Economy Hub, along with Fiona, who's on the call as well. Um, and this is the uh, agenda. So each speaker is going to have maybe five, seven minutes each to say a, a bit around a, a number of slides. Uh, I've got Katya Hansen, uh, Atta Ajayabi, and Sophie Thoranda. And they're going to introduce themselves and tell you a bit about their background. Then we'll get as quickly as we can into Q and A and discussion. Then next steps and close for a prompt one o'clock finish. So I'll keep an eye on the chat and um, I should keep your microphones off, please, if, if you can, so we avoid any background noise. But I'm going to invite Katya first of all to uh, tell us a little bit about circularity and data. Thank you very much, there. Peter. Uh, hello everyone, my name is Katja Hansen. I've been working in the field of the circular economy powered by the cradle to cradle design framework uh, for more than 30 years in various areas of industries, governments and NGOs. So I have a very broad background, more you can read on my LinkedIn profile, but today I would like to introduce to you an initiative that we started with the Ministry of the Economy in Luxembourg uh, about five years ago on pre-competitive data collection, uh, which is summarized in the product circularity data sheets, PCDS for short. Because the important thing is that we lose a lot of data uh, along the road in 
the linear setup of most of our current economy. We have, for most products, we have a very complex uh, supply chain. So the higher end products, uh, be it white goods like refrigerators or uh, automobiles or anything in that area, also including textiles, has a complex supply chain. And, and each tier in that complex uh, supply chain actually has a product. So I want to state very clearly that when I talk about a product, it's not necessarily the final product that uh, gets marketed to the consumer, but it is anything that is sold from one producer to the next. So that is our wide definition of a product in the product circularity data sheet. Product uh, content data is very expensive to gather uh, because there is no standardized way to doing that. And therefore, um, we, we lose a lot of that data, as you can see on the graphic, um, when we transport that information. So the existing green slides. Sorry, someone has to be muted, Alex. Um, the existing green standards like the EPDs, environmental Pro product uh, declarations, don't really have a lot of information or no information on circular qualities. And so we identified a clear lack in the market for any sort of standardized tool. And you all know that extended producer responsibility, EPR, is uh, very hard to determine if we don't track the data. So it is mostly uh, the loss of information that then makes it difficult to measure anything because obviously we can't measure if we can't describe. So that's why we say this is pre-competitive because the intention is not to come out with a, a figure and say this product is 42. It is really to provide the data for then proprietary tools to actually calculate circularity scores. And that's why it's very important to stress it's pre-competitive. So we call this a digital fingerprint for the circular qualities of products. It's not intended to repeat what is being done in other standards such as the EPD uh, or, or other uh, standards that describe products from various aspects. It's not supposed to talk about the energy footprint, the carbon footprint or any of these things. And I'll describe in a minute what we actually describe in the product circularity data sheet, but it is the digital fingerprint that should follow with the product along its uh, various integration processes along the supply chain. It's a Luxembourg initiative um, created and funded by the Ministry of the Economy of uh, the Grand Duchy of uh, Luxembourg and the a private consultancy positive impact in Luxembourg, which I work with. I'm a freelancer, but uh, this work uh, we have been working on together for more than five years. So what exactly do we have when I talk about the product circulated data sheet? We're looking here at uh, a multi-tiered supply chain where uh, a tier two producer creates a PCDS uh, that's passed on to the tier one producer who merges it possibly with other tier two uh, information. Then it goes on to the producer. And from there, you have a product circularity data sheet, which goes on with, it travels with the product to the distributors, to the customers, and also importantly for the circular economy to the recyclers. So uh, it's a repository of information that as a fingerprint uh, accompanies the product. So it is up to each individual manufacturer and supplier to fill in their share. So it's like a matryoshka doll, the Russian dolls that go one in one in one and they grow bigger. It travels along the whole network. It is 
a clear, and that was very important uh, to actually have a digitally transferable, just yes, no statements. Um, it addresses confidentiality issues and it allows us to avoid uh, text processing, which gets complicated when you want to merge it with other information. And the template has been tested with governments and private sectors. We have over the last five years of the development process, of course, refined the approach to the whole thing. And uh, it makes uh, EPR traceable. Just a quick insight and you'll find the whole PCDS. This is public on the website of pcds.lu, which is in my slides. We have five sections in the PCDS. The first one is uh, of general statements describing the product like an identification number, a manufacturer, possibly a manufacturing site. The second one addresses the composition and an example statement might be product contains more than 75 to 95% post-consumer recycled content, yes, no and then uh, the statements build on that. Uh, the product does not contain substances of very high concern, also very important from a material health perspective, which is something that is frequently ignored when we talk about circulating materials. Design for better use. So an example statement would be, can be maintained and repaired by untrained personnel at location of product use, and then other approaches on how the product might be repaired or maintained. Design for disassembly, a key driver for circularity. So an example statement would be can be demounted using reversible connectors or can be dismantled to component materials level. So that describes the product at the level of design for disassembly. And then again, very important driver for circularity designed for reuse. And in this case, uh, example statements might be designed for reuse with minimal modification, designed for com composting at uh, uh, in a home composter. And then there's of course, industrial composting. So the statements are listed in the PCDS that you can view uh, on the website that I already gave you. And um, it's also listed at the bottom of this slide. So we have standardized terms and formats, uh, which is one of the key drivers why we started the initiative. It is based on global standards and being yeah. discussed as a standard with the ISO. It's open source and auditable. There is a secure, trustable issuer. That is something we're currently uh, developing. So there will be unique identifiers, whoops. And it is uh, automated. Uh, it can be linked to existing data processing platforms through APIs. So uh, in summary, the benefits are that it saves time and cost and that uh, cradle to cradle and circular design guidance uh, is provided for suppliers. Because when you ask the questions, you're basically demanding that people think about the issue. And that's usually the first step to actually changing it. We have, um, for those more scientifically inclined, uh, just uh, published a, a broad description. This is a big paper in the journal Energies on product circulatory data sheets, uh, standardized digital fingerprint for circular economy data about products. So in much more detail than I'm able to give you today, and there is a very nice video, which we're also not going to show today. It's just four minutes, but it, it says exactly what the PCDS is and who it is trying to address. And uh, I look forward to a lot of questions. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Katya. Uh, pretty much on time there. And um, just reflecting a, a comment that came in earlier about previous webinars and this webinar, that every, everything will be uploaded onto the CE Hub um, website. Uh, so you, you can watch the video there. So um, I, I will take just one question now. I've just seen Abigail throw a question in. But Chip, I'll, I'll come back to yours um, after we've heard one or two other speakers. But uh, let's just throw in Abigail. 
about could blockchain technologies be used to ensure the data quality and traceability and work with the digital fingerprint? So absolutely, ledgers. yes, yeah. yeah, we're looking at blockchain. Um, it's not the only solution and it's not the only element that will make it work, but that is being uh, considered. Great. And, and a question for you to be thinking about, Katia, when, uh, when, we, when, when we come back for general discussion is, has this been applied in test cases um, that, that shows how it works and how it could contribution, uh, contribute to measuring successful circular economy intervention? So hold that, hold that question there. I'm yeah. Sarah Pia. I'm, I'm a Programme Director for Circular Economy and the ESG Transformation at, at Philips. Um, for those who, uh, who, don't, who aren't familiar with Philips, we're a health technology company, so really focusing on improving people's health and healthcare outcomes. So we have a portfolio that ranges from electric breast pumps to kind of big, lar large medical equipment like MRI scanners. So as a company, we have committed to really growing our business sustainably and responsibly. And what you see here in front of you is a, a set of ESG commitments that we have committed to for 2025. And they all deliver towards uh, four sustainable development goals, 3, 12, 13, and 17. Um, if we go into the next slide, so one very important part of these targets is related to circular economy. And uh, here you see a number of them. I won't go into too much detail, but they range from, you know, what we do with the design, right, uh, in terms of what we do with manufacturing, what happens, you know, with the products that we put onto market, and then also what happens with them at end of use. So it's a, really a little bit of a value chain perspective also in terms of what we do with circular economy. Now, um, I think what Peter asked me to talk about today was really around our circular revenue metric, right? Um, so this is a KPI, and maybe to start with what, what is uh, the circular revenues? So it's a, um, it's a revenue-based uh, uh, target, so where we are really looking into uh, what are the, the products, services, and solutions that we classify as circular. So any kind of revenues from these kind of products are considered circular revenues. And it was a KPI that we started with in, in 2015. And this is really a, you know, a time where there were there was limited circularity metrics out there. And we really wanted to get the started and getting the ball rolling in terms of bringing circularity into our portfolios and also the solutions that we were offering to our customers. Um, at that point in time in 2015, our baseline was 7%, uh, just for your information. And today we're at around 16%. So, you know, what are circular revenues? So if I, I give you a couple of examples, it, it includes products with recycled plastics, it's refurbished products, reuse of parts in our services, telehealth solutions, so more digital solutions. We also have performance and access-based models where we as a company retain ownership of, of the equipment offered as a service. Um, and I think when you hear all these examples, I, I, I think the, the, the essence of it is really that, you know, there's very many different ways of being circular. And it's also important to take into consideration your market and customer demand, right? Technical feasibility. So what do I do? What do I mean with that? So if we, if we, if we look back at 2015 and we look into the B2C market with vacuum cleaners, toothbrushes, what have you, at that point in time, I think the market was not really ready to move towards, let's say, service models. And at that point in time, it did make sense to say, hey, dear business, we really need to start working with integrating recycled plastics into your product design. So that was the way that our B2C products could contribute also towards circularity. Some of you may ask, you know, why are we focusing on a revenue-based metric? Well, it was quite simple, really, because, you know, uh, financial metrics really kind of speaks the business language. And we also had quite some success with another metric that we had in place, which was around how do we also uh, uh, move our portfolio towards eco-design uh, uh, products. Um, and maybe just to wrap it all up, right, so circular revenues is really a way for Philips to measure the circularity of the innovations that we put onto our market, right? Um, and also wanted to mention that we are working very closely and, and uh, aligning with many of the efforts that are happening globally around metrics, uh, not only with reporting disclosures that are asking, you know, this is what we would like to see you report on, 
but also like CTI in the creator by the World Business uh, uh, Council of Sustainable Development, circular ticks with, uh, with Alan MacArthur Foundation. And then I think over to you, Alex, I hope we get your slides uh, up and running as well. <laughs> Uh, th thanks, Sophie. So, I mean, just just to just to cap that off, you, you, the Philips global business, uh, 100,000 employers known all over the world, uh, fantastic reputation for innovation, particularly in the medical, has a series of business models around circular economy from recycled content all the way through to performance models and products as a service, as you've described. And then what you've laid over the top of that is a financial metric to pull that all together for your internal uh, teams uh, to sort of focus attention on this is where we're going as a business in the future. And some of those case studies on, on, on the different business models are on your website that people can um, go and look at in a bit more detail if they so wish. But you're one of the few examples that we know of an explicit financial indicator and metric that is being used to judge and, 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 and sort of monitor uh, and, and create strategy for, for the circular economy. So that, that was really, really great. And 25%, that's that's a big figure in a short space of time. It's doubling within 10 years, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We, we, we hope it's 100% by 2030. So, you know, we, 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 we keep our fingers crossed on that one. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, we're going to see whether we can go back to uh, Atta. Suzanne, I'll pick up your question if we um, if, if we manage to sort of run through with Atta. So that's great. You can look at the in the chat box, uh, Sophie, and anticipate the the question. Okay, back to back to you, Atta. Thank you. Um, I'm going to try again. So, but if if it doesn't work, um, Emily, maybe you can move forward. Um, uh, if if it doesn't work on my my side, so. Um, like I said, I was saying that the um, Sphera is a provider of ESG uh, solutions, including lifecycle assessment, consultancy, data, and software. But a particular challenge that um, we are trying to address and use the tools and data that we have available is to measure circularity in, in a way that is similar to the way that we um, perform a lifecycle assessment. So for uh, some of you, some of you might be familiar with life cycle assessment, but for the general uh, audience, LCA is a method that is widely used to account for the environmental um, and sometimes social impact of systems. It's um, particularly applicable to product sustainability and it has been used for corporate sustainability as well as well as um, regional country level and even global sustainability measurements. Um, and the, the advantage of LCA is it, it basically allows for a very numerical and a holistic assessment of, of a system, taking into account the impacts from the cradle uh, to grave. And also it's very practical, particularly if it's being supported by data sets of the, the background system. So for measuring circularity, um, what we did basically, we tried to implement a metric that was developed by Ellen MacArthur Foundation and a Granta design. Uh, basically to, to incorporate this into life cycle assessment tools and data. Now the advantage of doing so would be it would make measuring a, a transition towards circularity easier to be more practical. Um, it would basically allow for us to have a, a, a circularity, single circularity metric and report it along with the, the LCA results, such as a carbon footprint of a product. Um, it can be used for benchmarking products. Um, and this is something that a manufacturer can use to show the advantages of the products to a typical product on the market. Um, and it um, can be incorporated into R&D design procurement, and it can be also communicated as a single score um, number that it can be reported as the uh, measurement of circularity. So that, that is the, the MCI. And um, I'm just going to move forward there. So um, 
to measuring circularity, uh, basically the MCI is described as a score between zero to one. Um, zero, um, one is being completely circular for, for a system. Um, 0 0.1 would be completely linear in terms of flows. And anything below 0 0.1 would be um, basically less linear than, a, than an average product um, on a market. So um, there are quite, quite a few challenges on how to incorporate MCI into a life cycle assessment and how to measure that. When I explain um, the formula and the, the uh, calculations here. So um, essentially it is calculated based on data about um, the life and the um, basically performance of a product. Uh, with this toolkit that is developed, you don't need a, an additional software. Uh, it's, it's an additional toolkit that you would need to install for Gabi, which is an LCA software. And then with Gabi and this MCI tool, the results can be reported as a um, user interface that the users can input their data, including circularity data that they have gathered in order to calculate the MCI and their um, LCA um, basically results. So um, comparing how to do an LCA and how to compile a material circularity indicator, uh, the typical data that you would require uh, would essentially be the, the sources of material that you would need for an LCA, for instance. A, for manufacturing processes, you need the, the losses and the efficiency of the procedure. Um, also, you need to account for the treatments, the, the flows in and out of the, the manufacturing system. What happens to the waste at the end of life? Uh, if there is any recycling, how efficient it is, or if it's any uh, reclaiming and reusing to account for that at the end of life. You need to account for mass and often lifetime and the use intensity of products depending on LCA. But for a material circularity indicator, in addition, it's required to account for an average product's lifetime and an average product's intensity of use for benchmarking and comparison so that MCI can be calculated based on comparing this, this system to um, a typical uh, product on the market. And this is a data that we know it's it's hard to acquire sometimes because a there are millions of different products on the market, so it's hard to acquire the data on the, the average life lifetime and also the intensity of, of use is a is a very dynamic uh, metric that would that would change. Um, but at this point, the, the burden of collecting this data is essentially on manufacturers because many manufacturers tend to know about uh, the lifetime of the products from competitors or from their own production. So this is a data that if you are a manufacturer, you tend to, to know about this. So it can be used and incorporated into the MCI. And uh, so just, this is an advantage that if you are doing a life cycle assessment, which is quite common, then you can also attempt to uh, account for the measurement of circularity along your life cycle assessment and then you'll be able to report your results um, alongside the, the LCA results. So the way it works, you, it essentially starts with the company or, or uh, the person in charge to build the LCA model, collecting the data, building the model using an LCA software, um, and then to modify it in a way that's suitable for material circularity indicator, and then to run the calculations for, for the analysis. Um, so there are some technical aspects, for instance, for, for adapting an LCA into a, uh, an MCI model. You have to add shadow processes, something that we call to account for um, the input values of MCI into the system. Um, and then the model basically automatically calculates the MCI and reports it. And if you have this as the user interface, then you can get the results immediately by changing the uh, the parameters of your system. So I, I don't want to go into much technical details. So I'll leave that to to the Q and A um, in in, ca in case that um, somebody wants to know about this. But 
um, if you're interested in this, please, please get in touch and then we can have a uh, more detailed discussion about uh, both the MCI and also the service that they're uh, providing. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Atta. Um, several questions generated there about uh, open access and, and, and cost, which relates to a question that was asked earlier to Katya. So I'd ask you to be thinking about that. I've heard on the grapevine that we might have another presentation who from Tom, who was originally down on the program, but wasn't certain if he could make it. I can see his face on the screen. Um, and I don't know if Tom's there. Who's gonna, there he is. I think he's been submitting a bid uh, and he wasn't certain if he was going to make it uh, for 12 o'clock, but he has in, in true fashion. So, Tom, uh, so we've got a final short presentation for Tom to talk about another example of, of, a, of a measurement with a very specific application. So we wanted to sort of finish off, if we could, with a, uh, something that's very real uh, and, and um, can be shared uh, within, within reason on, on this presentation. So. Tom, uh, about five minutes, is that okay? Yes, it's early. No, and thanks, thanks, Peter. And um, yeah, really interesting presentations so far. So um, yeah, really good. And think this, this is something quite different, but something we can all relate to. I know many of us aren't wearing masks at the moment, but what was what was happening with the um, certainly at the start of the pandemic, there was a massive amount of single-use medical waste. Um, which has actually been an issue for quite a long time. It's built up over the last two to three decades, but the the use of masks and actually the the rubbish and the pollution generated by masks really put it into the into the public's uh, spotlight. Um, all of this coming at a time when people were starting to focus on net zero and uh, many of the factors around that, and also plastic plastic waste. Uh, so the new poster child became the um, became really the disposable plastic mask and we've been doing something about that in collaboration with the um, with the uh, CE Hub and the University of Exeter Business School so Peter's been great as a as a mentor for that so what have we done well we've um, and unsurprisingly we've created a a, a super alternative um, to this so again um, building around um, circular economy work so we're taking a what is it a disposable um, products? And we're not just talking about masks, we're talking about surgical gowns, we're talking about surgical drapes, um, isolation gowns, aprons, all of which generate around 88,000 tonnes of waste per year. Um, and uh, in excess of that, that's um, 300,000 tonnes of, of carbon emissions. Um, so really, really quite, quite impactful. So some of the, um, some of the work that we've done, I'll just cover 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 some of the some of the work. Uh, slides slides here. Um, so some of the work we've done here is we've looked at replacing uh, single use disposables in operating theatres. We've done this in Wales, and we've also done this in Cornwall. So these are um, a first of kind demonstrators. And when I say first of kind demonstrators, this used to be commonplace thirty to forty years ago. Um, but was phased out from all sorts of things like mad cow disease, so prion disease, um, and generally uh, issues with um, people th thinking that disposables are actually more effective, whereas actually the, the opposite is, is, is true. So we're working, working with that in local supply chains and local manufacturers on producing assured, so fully assured um, gowns, drapes, stero um, masks and hats. Um, and then taking them through the logistics ch chain, making sure that they're decontaminated to the to the right standards. And then and some of the other work we've been doing, and I've again done this with Exeter, is doing based on our practical on the ground work, doing roadmaps um, of how different healthcare systems may actually meet um, net zero targets through medical textiles. Um, one we've recently done for Wales going out to 2030 and uh, the good news on this is we're going to be able to share this report very shortly. Um, next thing here is what, where did the problem come from? It's built on a history of 30 years of healthcare waste. Um, it is an expensive and also vulnerable supply chain, but particularly expensive on the environment. Uh, and also we've got um, a lot of net zero challenges. And actually this area of 
turning disposable medical textiles into circular alternatives is very much low hanging fruit. So one of the things that we've been really working on is, is the infrastructure around the UK is not set up for uh, decontamination. So we've been working hard on um, building modular, uh, low carbon builds. So builds that can be built off site, they don't really disrupt the, um, disrupt the operations. And this is really important for, uh, if we're gonna be implementing certain things as all the other, it's not just the products or the infrastructure that you may need, and this is especially true. So this is one thing that we're really focusing on targeting at the moment. Uh, and we have planned builds of these first of a kind builds uh, for Wales and also in Cornwall. Uh, the proposal I was uh, doing has been for the Cornwall one, uh, so it was joined for submission at 1, 1 p.m. today, so hence my, not sure if I could make that. So the next here is um, really goes on to about our whole system and the system design that we've been working with. So you can see for our circularity is um, not just the traditional circularity of a laundry, which is around the reprocessing pathways, but also looking at areas around repurposing uh, and, then, and then recycling. Uh, but we really use recycling as a last resort, especially because recycling tends to be somewhat energy intensive. Um, and if we can keep the materials in the system longer without recycling, all the better. Uh, a good example of this is if we take a surgical gown, which may be a sterile surgical gown, we can then repurpose that after 60, 75 washes into a endoscopy gown. So it's a gown used for endoscopy procedures. Uh, it can then go as a patient gown after that. So a, uh, a gown that's used when people were having procedures. It can then after that be repurposed in the community into outerwear. So you essentially get four product life cycles out of one product. And then at the end of all that, then we can take it through uh, the, me the mechanical recycling process. Um, and all the time looking at all these different processes, improving the efficiencies, um, at several levels, so cleaning, textiles, water, uh, and all the all the net zero different proce processes here, including chemicals to minimize environmental impact, but also efficient chemicals, so we can bring down the thermal load uh, of, of decontamination or laundry. So the final thing I just want to touch on uh, quickly, quickly here is some of the some of the wider um, sort of wider. Uh, I don't know, I missed a slide here. Yeah. Some of the wider sort of um, returns that we get, we're getting and we're getting feedback from the um, stakeholders here is really around um, local economic multipliers. So investing into local areas because we've got local supply chain. We don't have to worry about reverse logistics or building stuff and making stuff over here and shipping it off. We can keep everything local, makes a more resilient supply chain as well. Uh, and it really stimulates employment in the community. Um, and really the stuff, the stuff that we're doing is, is very much cutting edge from a global basis. And we know this, we're engaging with uh, Medicine Sans Frontier, World Health Organization, World Bank, uh, and running workshops um, and interacting with them on the stuff that we're doing with, with the UK. So uh, anyone on this, uh, on this call who wants to get involved, uh, contact through through uh, Peter or myself and uh, yeah, very, very keen to engage about this, uh, this work we're doing. Uh, thank you very much and uh, apologies for the somewhat stuttered presentation. Um, I wasn't sure if I could make it at all. Okay, thank you. And thanks, Tom. And I think the question for you to be thinking about is in terms of measurement, in terms of you've, you've made some claims there about the benefits. So what, what are the metrics and indicators that you you use? So, but I'm going to, I've teed up some people to come in on the mic and ask questions. Um, and if I've followed my own uh, notes here. I'm going to start with Fiona uh, about frameworks to catch you. Then we drop down to Abigail to Atta. Then Chip, he's got a, a, he's got a part A and a part B. And then we go to Suzanne and David. I'll try and get everybody in. But if we can keep the questions short and the answers tight, then we can get as many as we can. So Fiona, if you're there, would you come in and uh, ask your question to Katia? Hi, Katia. Um, I'm a, um, a PhD student at the University of Manchester. Uh, I'm in textiles, circular economy for textiles, and um, uh, I thought your presentation was really interesting. I just wondered what framework um, the 
um, you know, the, 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 da the data collection is based on that uh, you, were you were speaking of? We, um, is there a follow up to your question? Or was that it? No, it was, it was, I was just looking for the, 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 na the name of, of the, you had called the, it wasn't questions, it was something like that, the data collection. You, you had a certain, that was a statement. Statements, thing. yeah. They're based on our uh, three decades plus work on the cradle to cradle design framework, which uh, is also described in a Springer publication about 10 years ago, seeing that you're doing the PhD, you need all that scientific referencing um, on material passports. So, uh, and that we tried uh, in the built environment with the Horizon 2020 project called Buildings as Material Banks. And that all basically culminated in uh, the realization that we didn't have a standardized tool to collect the data that uh, systems such as the one described by ATA um, are then actually processing. So we found that companies we were working with in the circular economy field were getting data requests uh, on all different levels. And uh, it, it was hugely costly for individual companies to respond to the diverse uh, requests they were getting. And so a digital fingerprint follows the product and then can be input. But the statements are built on the cradle to cradle design framework, um, which I usually lecture about at the CE masterclass. And you can find lots of information and feel free to contact me afterwards uh, if you need more pointers on that. Okay. Super, thank you. I think I might suggest a, a, a special interest group that, to follow on from this, because we're doing a lot of work on this topic. And I noticed that Chris put a comment in from Circular, is it Circular, Chris? Um, um, who are doing work in this area as well around uh, blockchain, fingerprinting. It's a big uh, topic. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of interest in that. So we might, we might, we might take that on board and, and do some follow up on that. So that's great. Yeah, I'm happy to help with any introductions. They, they're, they're very proactive in terms of, you know, the, uh, the, the ecosystem of circular economy. Great. Yeah. Yeah. I was talking to them last week in London at an event. So yeah, so we know, know their work pretty well. So that's great. Thanks for making a nod to that, Chris. Uh, Abigail, uh, are you there? I am. Hello. Um, there's a question for Atta, just really going back to your circularity toolkit. Um, often the LCA databases are very expensive to access. I know myself, I tried to do it with my dissertation and I couldn't get access to the data I needed. Um, what would be the cost of the toolkit? Is it going to be open? Is there any sort of free versions? So the, um, at the moment, um, unfortunately, there is there is no free version. So what, what we provide is um, a basically training course on this this um, tool, along with the support on the LCA model. Um, but for students, uh, there are discounts as far as I'm, I'm aware. So if, if you're still a student, you can reach out and um, you can arrange um, a, a discount. Um, but this, um, I think at this point, it's relatively new. So the market is, we just, scoping to see what what is the market for, for a tool like this um and we can perhaps find out way to make it more um economical for, for industries so the advantage of using the the, the user interface is that it, it allows for hundreds or thousands of simulations and different scenarios with with, it, with one single basically license and contract and that would significantly reduce the costs of um the license and model and everything um and yeah so this is um cost is an issue that i'm i think would be um would be a big deal for for some um, okay for some, yeah. okay so the, it's commercial proprietary at the moment but there may be opportunities for reducing cost uh this training open access versus proprietary, big issue in data. So Chip, over to you, because you've got a couple of questions exactly on that topic and uh, anybody yeah. on the group chip in with the answer. Yeah, actually uh, I'm I'm at the RCA and the Textile Circularity Center, but my two questions are generally about openness 
and public access. So the first one is for Katya. Um, I love the PC uh, DS yes. format. Um, I just would love to see a public repository of examples and particularly the way that you describe the Matrokia, that doll folding, because it would be really great to just see an example and you know maybe Philips could have something out about their products. That would be very exciting. And then my second question B is to Atta, and uh, it's just about whenever there's a metric like an MCI, um, I imagine someone could get very smart and play optimization with the metric, um, particularly with using the tool like Gabby. And I'm curious, um, is there just any thoughts or any hope to kind of at least uh, uh, expose this kind of uh, gamification or gaming of a metric? or maybe even ways of making it so it's not possible to actually make true circular changes to the process or the product that you're modeling. Thank you. Okay, so me first. Um, the PCS is designed to be open access. We have uh, test flown it uh, a couple of times, of course, in the development process. Uh, and so there is no database out there yet. But the real intention and driver, that's why we called it pre-competitive, is really it doesn't contain any confidential data and it is meant to be. So what we envision, and I couldn't go deeper into the whole data processing um, system that we are designing, but the idea is that companies make these PCDSs available on their websites for other systems to then read it. So there will not be one global repository because then updates to products uh, will have uh, a lethargy throughout the system. You know, keeping data true and current and actual is a challenge in data processing. So we're addressing all of that. Um, and it, it, so the PCDS is owned uh, and managed by its creator, but is publicly accessible so that proprietary softwares can then access that and process this into, like I said, a 42 or a 75. Uh, it is really just the, the baseline that we need to come up with that. And that is of course what uh, makes systems such as Gabi so valuable, but also open to flaw. Sorry, Atta, if you permit. Um, I, I was an, on an expert committee with Mark, Mark Goodcope, who is the founder of Gavi, some 15 years ago to actually look into uh, some of those issues. It's a different topic, so I won't go there. But that's a challenge for those uh, processing systems. And the PCDS comes first, and, and then it can be processed. Okay. Great, uh, Atta, and, uh, and I've also invited Sophie and Tom just to comment on, on LCA and data within their work as well. So Atta, um, over to you. Thank you. Um, that was a very good question. So uh, we had lots of internal discussions about this, and, and we are aware that uh, if somebody's doing their own LCA, it's possible that they can basically um, play uh, with, with the model to to try to attempt to get more desirable uh, results. So there are there are uh, some some techniques to basically um, try to avoid this. Um, uh, the, the first one is the assumptions of the study must be reported very clearly. So this is something that if you cannot just report the numbers, you should also report the assumptions of the study uh, allocation, end of life. Uh, your flows, elementary flows, etc. So the, these should be reported, and it's becoming more and more common in an ISO compliant uh, report to report on these. Uh, the other, the other thing is, which is again becoming um, more common, is uh, having critical review for our LCAs. So this is commonly done by an event, independent person being approached to do the LCA or to review the LCA to criticize it and to say why they might disagree with that. Um, and this is another step that is becoming more common. It's not necessary, but it's becoming common in practice. Uh, for, for the MCI tool, similarly, there are four parameters that are critical and they can significantly change the results. And as we expect the manufacturer to report these, 
uh, it's very important that there is transparency on, on these four parameters. What is the average life of a product on the market? And what is the average usage of this product uh, are two parameters that uh, typically the manufacturer is responsible to collect these data and then to compare it to their own internal data. Um, ideally, you would want to have a data set for all products on the market and have to, to know about the average life of all products. But we know that's pretty much impossible. Uh, you cannot even compare two washing machines. They provide different services that have different specifications. So, okay. um, yeah. That's a, that's, thanks, I'm conscious of time. I just want Sophie and Tom to have a comment and then we're gonna to go to Suzanne and then David for two questions um, uh, back to back. So Sophie, would you wanna just comment on LCN data in and measurement inside Philips? Well, maybe I just wanted to add a couple of other reflections, right? Because one of the things that we're seeing is that if, if we look at metrics, right? Uh, let's, uh, I'm taking the CTI indicator that we work very closely with from, from the World Business Council. What we're seeing is that they look very much at what's happening within your company boundaries. And I think that, that, that in itself is a little bit of a shortcoming because in many essence, I think to, to what you were saying, Katja, it's, it's, it's very much a value chain perspective. And what we're seeing that if we wanna create claims and help our customers to understand the benefits of our circular solutions, we sometimes need to create projects with our customers to, to get the right data points that we need in order to quantify it, right? So, it's, it's both a, an upstream and a downstream uh, uh, question in that sense. And, and also to your point, Atta, about the, you know, what is the average lifetimes, right? That is also something that we see as a very important thing to look into. Because if we look at circularity metrics, we tend to look at inflow and outflow. And what we're not seeing is, you know, in some industries, we're really designing equipment that is on the market for a very long time. So very low obsolescence, right? And that is also not uh, uh, um, properly taken into consideration in many indicators. And what we're seeing there is just your point. It's a, huge, it's a big struggle to get that data. How, what do you compare it with, right? And that's really, you know, there, there, there are so many elements to take into consideration from that perspective. Um, and I think that's also why it's so important that we're seeing this that huge dynamic now within this field, where we see more and more convergence towards this is where we need to go towards. Uh, in that sense. Right. Okay. Thanks, Sophie. That's a, a nice, um, nice sort of expansion of, of the previous answers. And Tom, a quick, uh, quick comment from you on LCA in your work, which is very, very important. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, it's it's critically important to our stakeholders. Um, and if we have a look at the tools, like Gabby, you'll get 16 different outputs for um, LCL impact, impacts. But what they're really interested in, key performance indicators really, is number one, carbon. So they're looking at, they want to look at CO2 equivalents. Um, they like like looking at waste generation. So we have how much waste can be saved and then water as well. Um, the, the other thing which ties, in, ties into this as well is, for instance, if we're looking at an LCA for a surgical drape, so a drape you put on a patient during an operation, um, you can complete an LCA, and we've just done this with University College London with, with uh, utilising Gabby. Um, however, there's 440 different types of drapes, for instance, on the NHS Wales framework. Um, so if we're going to run an LCA on those, so we're starting to work on tier two LCAs where we take material equivalents, weight, and we look at that. So we can actually do a top level with all the assumptions, make it very clear that this is an approximate LCA. Then the other things to consider is combining other things which are important to the circular economy, like how do you combine other things such as price, local economic multipliers, um, and again, on chips thing, transparency and accountability of the system. So the LCA is only as good as the manufacturer's information they'll put in. How do you know that manufacturer's information? How do you validate it? How do you quantify that? All these sorts of things we're trying to you know, work on. Well, we are working on uh, and you know, really, really good to work in this area where there's some really good academic um, Looking into this, yeah. Thank you. Right. Thanks, thanks, Tom. And I think Amy, Amy from Innovate has just commented, you know, about many tools falling short in in this area. Um, so uh, it's again another sort of 
thorny 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 issue that need, needs addressing to you know substantiate claims that are made in, in general but also around claims for circular economy uh um not, not only in the material area but in the economic area as well so uh suzanne uh, we, we we've got to, we're going to run a little bit a little bit tight on time but suzanne and then david uh your question was aimed at sophie i think suzanne uh yes can you hear me okay yeah yeah so yeah sophie you talked about some internal measurements that you use so circular revenue and and so on um, I just wondered what kind of metrics you help um, provide for your clients for them to demonstrate the benefits of using the circular the products. So um, we have um, eco passports, environmental brochures, but they talk really more about our specifications. So um, a little bit to what Katja was mentioning around circular design, etc. What we're moving more and more towards is more LCA based claims, right, on CO two emissions. And one of the things that we also want to work more closely with customers is also in terms of what is actually the material reduction, right? Because those are claims where we don't, we, we see more claims around CO2 reduction, but I think also important is to start looking into what are, you know, how are you actually helping our customers to get to a certain outcome with less materials? And that is to my point earlier on, this, this requires customer projects, right? To really get all the right kind of data points uh, uh, um, to, to, to create these kind of claims. And I think in the health, health sector, that's especially important, isn't it, about health outcomes. Tom, do you want a quick word on that before we go to David for his question? Uh, yeah, just very, yeah, very briefly, but you know, you need the customers, you need the engagement, and actually what we've found is that health, uh, if we do, if you interview, well, the annual interviews for uh, NHS staff, more than 90% of them consider environmental sustainability is critically important. A lot of them haven't put it together that this may actually mean circular economy, but um, a really good port report from Philips, which was happy enough to be uh, fortunate to be involved in, has shown how important circularity is to get to sustainability and to net zero. The door's wide open for healthcare. They're looking for low hanging fruit. They're really good customers. They will feedback, and that's a really good population as an anchor institution to um, really engage with and inform for, for wider change. Great. And David, are you still there? I am. Um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, for, uh, thank you. Thank you for this uh, seminar. It was really interesting. A quick question for Sophie, because I think we're running out of time. And the question is too big, probably. But it's, uh, if you, you know, if you see like, uh, what is the, your insights? What is the major difference when you look at finance uh, of, uh, you know, of an organization, a product uh, that you're creating uh, as compared to the linear uh linear product and what is the circular product and you know what is what is something that surprised you or something that you know from from the revenue and accounting perspective something that you didn't expect to find out i think the, the biggest complexity is really kind of the ownership towards delivering on this kpi so we have these kpis trickling down for each business Mm. From a financial perspective, a, a sales target is very clear, right? But what we're seeing with circularity, like I was mentioning before, there are so many different ways to be circular. In some instances, it's really the R&D that are in the lead to, to, to drive something, for example, with sustainable plastics. And in other sessions, it's more the service and solutions delivery people around how do we continue with upgrades, etc. Others, it's really marketing. So finding that kind of right governance set up also with clear ownership and having those conversations with the people who drive those decisions that has been a, a very big learning <laughs> a learning journey in that sense um, and a very important one as well so, sounds like a topic for another webinar david and we'll invite you in uh, so amy amy said she's looking forward to a special interest group on this topic and uh, Amy were, uh, leads the Innovate UK Super Economy CR&D program, which has substantial funding. And there'll be another call out for that, or it might even be out now, saying that she would like to see more projects that address some of these challenges being discussed today. So that's a thumbs up from Amy. So we better finish there. Emily, um, have I covered everything uh, before, before we close down, other than to thank all the speakers in the audience for their contributions so i just want to make sure i haven't missed anything 
Yeah, all good. And um, the only thing I will say is we do have a feedback form um, to help us sort of shape future events to so make sure that they are relevant for you. Um, I popped the link in the chat. So if you could just spend a couple of minutes to fill that out, that would be really useful. Great. And so Katya, thank you for coming in from Berlin, having flown over from Nova Scotia. Atta, I'm not sure where you are today, possibly Exeter. Tom, thanks for joining us after sort of a breakneck finish to make your submission. And Sophie, thank, thanks again for coming in and giving us a, a perspective from a global corporate, um, which is always uh, a, ni a nice balance and a nice mix with uh, the other speakers. So we really appreciate that. Plenty of things for people to go and look at and follow up videos uh pcds um you know tom tom's work sophie's case studies on her website and at is available for a, a little bit of free advice if you need it but but he he's also um, got to make sure that he, he sort of uh, covers himself with his new new job so that's great thanks everyone and uh have a great rest of the day wherever you are and look out for the webinar series for the autumn and the winter in due course bye